You are listening to Leading the Factory Forward with your host, Lynn Friest. We share interviews with manufacturing experts and strategies for embracing the digital future, recruiting a new workforce, finding new business. Lynn is an advanced manufacturing strategist and leadership consultant who is on a mission to show manufacturing leaders how to improve their current operations while preparing for a digital future. And here's your host, Lynn Friest. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Leading the Factory Forward. This is episode 85, and it's titled Four Ways to Help Working Moms During the Pandemic. And our special guest is Linda Wilson. At Leading the Factory Forward, our goal is to help you create a compelling future for yourself, your teams, and your organization. I encourage you to visit my website and download the summary at the bottom of the podcast episode, and to use that as a tool to capture notes and ideas as you explore the concepts of this episode or to help you get started on your journey and to stay up to date on new episodes, please download the free worksheet, Three Steps You Need for a More Productive Workday. In this episode, I'm excited to be talking with Linda Wilson. Linda has an amazing breadth and depth of skills and knowledge. Linda was head of global manager development at John Deere from 2017 to 2020. Prior to that, she also specialized in leading and teaching change management. These days, Linda is pursuing a master's degree with Kansas State. Also, as this episode was recorded, it is March and it's National Women's History Month in the U.S. So today with Linda, we're going to be talking about four ways to help working moms during the pandemic. First, Linda will talk about the issue, the things we need to know about it, then the impact. What is the studies and stuff telling us about what has been that pandemic's impact on women? And finally, Linda will offer four possible solutions that could help us minimize the impact that it's had going forward. Welcome, Linda. Thank you for being on the podcast with us today. We're going to be talking about help for working moms during the pandemic, during, before, and after. But first, Linda, I'd like you to share a little about yourself and what you've been up to and the work you're doing. Great. Thanks, Lynn, for having me. I really appreciate it. It's really fun to get to be a part of your podcast. And it's very meaningful for me to get to talk about this topic as well. So yeah, I'm Linda Wilson. I worked for John Deere for 22 years. In August of 2020, I resigned from John Deere as a part of their reorganization and their voluntary separation program. Since then, I have been in a graduate program with Kansas State University. So I'm taking courses toward a master's degree in industrial organizational psychology. So I'm also involved in some pro bono work with a nonprofit, doing some training work here and there, and then also just kind of taking this time as a hiatus to focus on my studies. And also I have a dad who has dementia and diabetes, so it's also a good time to take care of him. And so that's my world today. So and you were going to share with us ways to help working moms during the pandemic. And now as we move to a new phase of this pandemic, and so take it away, what would you like to start with? Yeah, you know, it wasn't very long that COVID really started impacting our world right around now. You know, we're recording this March 23rd, 2021, and it's nearly exactly a year ago because I remember it was, I was on spring break myself, 2020. I always take that week off because it's my birthday. My son was home from college. He was in his senior year to become a music teacher. And it was very strange for him as well. He was forced to change to teaching online. And a couple of things happened that week. We were told to also, we were mandated to work from home in my job. And my son and I were found ourselves working at home together. My husband was an essential worker, so he was still going into the office. And then my daughter was in school and she was just in her apartment in another town. So what happened with my son is he took attendance and reported one of his students missing from his class. And he got a very nasty email from the student's mother complaining about that feedback on her student when she was dealing with so much. She was a banking professional. She was dealing with everything that was going on with the pandemic and the quarantine. She worked in Chicago. They were trying to learn and understand how they were supposed to have their children attend school now. And every teacher was doing things differently. And her son happened to miss his music class. 
in her world, this wasn't a big deal. And to receive what she felt like was a kind of a scathing note about her son missing the class seemed like a gross injustice. It just wasn't a big deal. And, you know, this kind of hit my son a little hard. He felt badly about it. And it just thought, wow, you know, it made me think about that mom's world. Another thing that happened is I had a chance to talk to a colleague in Brazil And I asked him how things were going, where are you working, how is the workforce handling things there? And he said, oh, yeah, it's very interesting. Everybody's working from home. I said, what's happening with HR issues? And he said, oh, yeah, you know, there's a working mom whose kids are at home with her and her manager has already called me talking about what should he do because her performance is really suffering and how should he handle her performance review with her poor performance. That sent up a red flag for me because I thought, how does he know that this is poor performance? What is the situation that says that this is poor performance? Because there's a difference between I heard her children's voice in the background during a phone call versus she's missed every deadline for five weeks straight. Those are two different things. One is a performance issue. The other one is not. The other one with the children's voice in the background has nothing to do with business outcomes, for example. So those things really made me reflect on what was going to happen for working parents, especially working women during the pandemic. As you think about that transition, what are some of the key things that women in particular face during this transition to working from home? Yeah, so, you know, it's long been documented that at home, women find themselves faced with sort of the second shift. So even before the pandemic, there's been a lot of research that women often find themselves doing more work at home than their partner. You know, they call the second shift, taking more responsibility for the cooking and cleaning and daycare and or care for the children and so forth. And there's some famous research about that. It has gotten better over time, but some of the most recent research still shows that women are doing 1.9% more more of the work from home. So now you bring the pandemic along, daycares and schools have shut down, everybody's at home, there's little help going on. In fact, some research that was done in the September timeframe of 2020, so this is when things were kind of really at a peak, at least in the U.S., 60% of working parents had no outside help in caring for their kids or educating their kids. You know, so everybody was basically homeschooling, even though their kids were attending school online, depending on the age, they needed some supervision while they were doing that. And so parents in general were spending an additional 27 hours a week on household chores and childcare and education on top of what they were trying to do for their job. And so women in particular were, according to this survey, we're spending 15 more hours a week than men on domestic labor as well. So half of the respondents in this survey were saying that, and I think this includes both men and women, that this was impacting their performance at work, that they were concerned about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I can imagine even with everyone's best intentions, for example, the men didn't know how to do the work at home, for one thing, so they had to be trained. And two, this idea that work will be interrupted by things, especially if you're trying to, you know, oversee schooling that goes on. At the very least, these are new things that just make it even harder, I think, for both parents. Yeah. And this issue is kind of maybe one thing that's going on in this whole world, you know, all the health concerns that were going on at the same time, financial concerns were probably coming in. Everybody was concerned about will they have a job and then the pressures of that job, you know, depending on the work that you were doing, there might have been more work to get done, especially, you know, if your audience is largely factory managers and they were considered an essential business, their business might have been ramping up, yet they might have lost some of their work workforce at the same time. So yeah, no picnic right now, to say the least. Yeah, I can remember talking to a colleague that he had to decide how to have half of his people in the facility, but the other half gone because if any one group would have gotten the illness, then everybody would have been out. So he was actually balancing a split work schedule because he had to have it that way for just to keep things going. Yes, a really smart strategy to have, right? Because then if somebody did have a case of coronavirus, he didn't lose his entire workforce for a two-week quarantine period. Yeah. Well, and I recall, again, more on the home front, colleagues had four children of high school all the way down through grade school. But she was saying that all of this impacted her children differently. Some really thought it was actually worked quite well for them. Some, especially in the lower grades, were really struggling with it. 
Yes. So we, you know, we talked about the financial pressures, the health pressures and mental health for sure is something that everybody was dealing with and may have been surprised about their own reaction. And like you just mentioned, their children's reaction. And then, you know, not only each situation is unique with the age of the kids, how their kids are reacting to it. Maybe they don't have kids. Maybe they have a parent that they're taking care of. And then something that I wasn't even thinking of, but I came across in what I was reading is what if you have a special needs child during this time and the support system that you had relied on before wasn't there. That is something that you can't just set aside for an hour long meeting. And this family that was highlighted in an article that I read, they couldn't give their special needs son an iPod and occupy that son for a half hour because he would throw the iPod across the room. You know, he just didn't have that ability. So they had to make some tough decisions and enroll their son in a private school and then have their other three children at home with them. And, you know, so that was an additional expense of $20,000 a year. You know, so these are just the little micro stories of what's going on among millions and millions of families, not only in the U.S., but around the world. I recall another colleague that what she described was she and her husband kind of split the day because they had a very young child. And so one worked in the morning and one worked in the afternoon while the other provided the necessary child care because it was a two-year-old or whatever. But again, they had a workplace that was somewhat understanding of this is how they were going to change their work schedules. Whereas I'm sure many managers had trouble adjusting to that kind of a thing. Exactly, exactly. You know, kind of taking it back to the impact on women. And in September, the figure was in the 800,000 range, 865,000 women left the workforce in the U.S. And at that time, it was four times greater than the number of men who had left the workforce. So the impact was huge on everybody. You know, we had record levels of unemployment. Some of it was voluntary, some of it was not. So why should we worry about women leaving the workforce? So the one thing is because women have worked very hard to enter the workforce and we've lost so much ground in an instant almost with the pandemic. You know, women occupy the hospitality industry and the healthcare industry to a greater degree than men do. And those were some industries that were hit hardest. And so that's one reason why women were impacted greater in terms of leaving the workforce. In addition, in industries where women are non-traditional, it took them longer to enter it. And so they have less seniority in those industries. And they might have been the first ones to be furloughed or laid off when it came time to make those decisions, if that was the reason and the way that they were making those decisions. So now, you know, all that ground was lost. And it's very tragic in terms of what women were trying to do in terms of equity. And of course, we want women in the workforce because that helps families get out of poverty when everybody has those choices. Of course, we want women to have just as many options for their life as men have in terms of how they make a living and fulfill their dreams, right? And then, of course, when you have a diverse workforce, you're going to have a more innovative company, more ideas, and more creativity in the workplace. So all those things are reasons why this is a very important issue for everybody to pay attention to and try to get it back on track. Sure. Well, I can imagine that, as you mentioned, uh, women can be more engaged in those essential industries. So it was a sort of a double whammy that they were actually required to be at work and yet their children would be home. So it was a true dilemma for many of them, I think. I couldn't do both. Literally. And some felt they had no choice, but there was actually a female factory manager that I was talking to who, you know, before she had a conversation with her boss about what they could do in terms of a flexible schedule, she's like, I thought my only option was going to be to resign. I just didn't know how I was going to do it. But fortunately, she had a very supportive leader who helped her figure out how could she get this done among her staff and herself and her schedule. You know, she was a single mom, had three young kids, was managing a small factory and they worked it out. And so with that, you know, that company was able to retain that talent that they had invested so much in and that relieved for her a lot of stress that I'm sure, you know, if that had gone on, you know, they would have either lost the talent or she would have suffered tremendously. So I think there were some things that we found out about work during this time that became possible in terms of, especially in terms of remote work. I won't say it made it easier, but it made it possible maybe. So uh, yes, yeah. (laughs) 
You know, there's, I think there's a debate about the remote work situation. If you have an opinion about whether remote work makes you more productive or less productive, you can find the research to support that. There will be a study out there that says one way or the other. And so I think it kind of depends on the situation. And it's really important to be specific about what is the type of work that's trying to get done and what is the environment at home that you're trying to get that work done in. But we did learn that business goes on when the workforce is at home, didn't we? Well, then it was interesting to me because I know, at least in my experience working, we started having more and more remote teams, teams in different parts of the globe. So we'd kind of dipped our toe in the water, but we kind of drew a line that, hey, if you're within 30 miles of the workplace, you're supposed to be in it versus, well, somebody's a thousand miles away. We know they can't and that's okay. But (laughs) we kind of had to shift our thinking on some of those things. Yeah. If you're next door, stay home because there's a (laughs) pandemic. Yeah. What other special challenge that women faced with respect to, we talked a little bit about childcare, but were there other pieces of it just in terms of, you know, managing expectations between their families and their workplace? Yeah, for sure. You know, childcare. And then of course, just duties around the home, you know, who's going to be responsible for laundry, who's going to be responsible for meals and grocery shopping and all of those kinds of things, you know. And I think many families found that at home together all the time, you know, if you you didn't have, if you weren't used to having conversations about things that needed to be addressed, boy, that came to a head probably pretty quickly, one way or the other, maybe in a healthy way, maybe in an unhealthy way until that got figured out. So all those things are coming to bear there. And so all of that adds up and without solutions, without reassurances, without collaboration and community, I think I have found that women can fall into a state of losing their confidence in saying, you know, yeah, I am a professional and and this is what I should be doing. And they can lose their confidence that this is what they should be doing. And that can inadvertently lead to, yeah, I, I need to be exiting the workforce and doing something else right now where they could find a solution that would work for everybody and keep their talents in the profession that they've chosen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's certainly in my work with manufacturers, they are running short of people. I mean, there's not just short of skilled people, they're short of people. So they're trying to find a much more diverse workforce that potentially will work in manufacturing. But then that means they do have to address some of these issues that they haven't had to address in the past. When they do, they can be very successful. I know at one of the facilities I worked in, about 40% of the workforce was women. And it was a great place to work, you know, but they had to understand some things would be differently than when it was an all-man workforce. Exactly. Yeah, that is also a great point that you are really limiting yourself if you are only marketing to a certain demographic, whether it's your hunt for talent or your hunt for customers, right? So that's another business case for that diversity. Yeah. And I'd like to circle back to how the managers have to change or needed to change during this time. And you mentioned earlier the that distinction between I can hear kids in the background versus the reports aren't on time. I think managers had to not focus on attendance, whether it be attendance in endless Zoom meetings or focus on results. And, and it's probably a very useful change to make, but it was something that certainly was overdue. Definitely. You know, it kind of goes back to performance management basics. You know, what are the outcomes that were achieved and what were the impacts of those outcomes? You know, just activity alone does not equal business outcomes. And so if you're counting activity, what did that activity amount to? Just a bunch of busy work or did it actually result in something that had an impact? You know, you can count if widgets make your money, then you can count widgets. Okay, fine. So definitely need to focus on that. The other thing that I think is important to bring up is being aware of bias, especially unconscious bias. And just by definition, you cannot be aware of unconscious bias, but you can be aware that it exists and that you need to understand that in your decision-making process, it exists. It's important for companies and for managers to kind of build into their processes and their decision-making steps, defend those steps from unconscious bias. And there's, there's ways that they can do that. Well, and I wonder, have managers been able to, or should they be able to ask, especially the female workforce, what do they need? Because it may be a little bit different and it may be once they're aware of it, it's things they can work with, but they aren't simply aware of it. 
Exactly. Yeah. So maybe we can talk about kind of some areas of solutions that would be helpful for women in the workforce now. Sure. And again, you know, before I get into some solutions, let's kind of set the context of where we are now. You know, so I think, especially for myself, since I'm a student and I'm doing, you know, pro bono work here and there, sometimes to me, it feels like it's almost over, that the pandemic is almost over. You know, I've gotten one of my vaccine shots. I'm about to get my second one, et cetera. But it is far from over. Some schools are still half at home. Some schools are back in the building, but not full time. So there's still this kids at home situation going on. Some parents have chosen to keep their kids at home. In terms of colleges, those are still largely online and they're making decisions right now about summer sessions and fall sessions. Businesses are just maybe starting if they weren't essential businesses or the worker wasn't essential for being home. They're just starting to go back into the office and deciding how to do that. But they're by no means financially recovered if they were financially set back. It's had some window cleaners in, for example. And it was the first time since I've been using window cleaners that I was able to schedule them the next day. For five years, I've been using this window cleaning company and it's always been about a six week waiting time before I could schedule them. They were available the next day because they just haven't had the business. And I was talking with them about why. And then they said all of their clients are still slowly recovering as well. So So we're still getting there. So that means that, you know, maybe moms and dads are in a better place and they've been relieved of the work that was on their plate at home and their ability to, you know, their days are a little bit shorter in terms of that double duty. Maybe they've been called back to work if they were furloughed, maybe not. So we're kind of just beginning that recovery, but I think there's a long way back. Sure. I think too that We have spent some time now learning how to do this work, so it's not all new quite as much as it was, you know, eight months ago. So people have learned to be more successful at remote work, even if it's not less stressful. At least we've got some ways that we know kind of work. I think that helps, too. You can get some new routines that help you get it through the day. Yeah. So as far as solutions, kind of the first one is to reset expectations. And that really comes along with probably a running theme that's been a part of our conversation today that, you know, if you didn't change some of your business model during COVID, you should think about doing that now. You know, if your business model is exactly the same as pre-COVID, what did you do differently? You know, did you digitize anything, et cetera? Well, with that should come a resetting of expectations of the work as well. So what changed in business conditions that can also change everybody's goals that then is going to change what success looks like? And so that's going to have a bearing on how performance is evaluated, et cetera. And, you know, especially this was really important last March, you know, as everybody was adjusting judge less harshly, you know, put yourself in another person's shoes, give everybody grace for that period of adjustment, spend a lot of time being human and just reset those expectations. And so giving everybody time to adjust, that's the first set of solutions. Mm -hmm. I recall uh, I was coaching a senior financial executive last January, and he had just in passing talked then about, well, we're thinking about, uh, you know, exploring some more work for home options for some of our staff who we normally haven't done that with. And of course, by the time I talked to him in March, he said, "Uh, yeah, we're all home. (laughs) And we've had to figure, (laughs) we had to figure it out. And then as I talked to him a month or so after that, he's saying, you know, we lease a lot of space to have people here that we've been getting along just fine without. And so it was interesting how his perspective had changed then because earlier he didn't really think remote work would work in his business. But obviously, just about everybody found that remote work can work in some way in your business. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There's a lot of business models that change. You know, I noticed when I watch PBS, Viking Cruises always runs commercials. Well, they started doing virtual tours of places that you normally wouldn't have access to. Well, they started offering that as a different business model so they could at least stay in touch with their customer base while they couldn't do cruises. You know, another one is a local florist just created an impromptu drive through so that she could continue to have customers, but even though she couldn't have them inside of her, her store. You know. Well, and I think some of this moving forward, uh, technology has allowed some things. Again, while we think of not being able to go into the office or the factory or whatever, but now 
it means we can connect with, say, a factory in another country. You know, so the remote work, we got a lot of practice in doing more remote work than we ever had before. And so I think it does open some opportunities, although we do have to reset. You know, does work mean sitting in a chair eight hours a day or does work mean getting something done? Yeah. (laughs) When it's due. The second solution set that I wanted to offer was flexible arrangements. And we have been talking about that all along. So flexible hours, you know, you have that couple that split the day. I had a colleague who she would work in the morning and then she would take over care for her son from her husband in the afternoon. And then she would get back on to work in the later part of the evening. And then she would use her vacation on Fridays. And that was another thing, you know, encouraging your employees to use their vacation, use all of their options, use all of their benefits. And part-time work is another flexible arrangement that I would encourage businesses to offer. In my experience, it's not one that Manufacturing businesses are keen and eager to offer, but it's definitely something that I think should be looked at as an option, especially if they want to attract that talent of working moms. Sure. My particular interest is in the silver talent. The whole part-time thing is fairly appealing because the silver talent may not want to work 50-hour weeks, but they might work 20-hour weeks and have a shared job with someone else. And again, not common, not something we've seen a lot of, but Again, attracting a wider range of talent into your business, it might be possible. Yes, exactly. So then a third solution set is temporary workplace perks. You know, so this is something that it's it's been a long temporary. I don't know that anyone predicted this would be a year ahead of us and then some, but some temporary perks to consider would be meal and grocery delivery or a stipend for that. Laundry services, you know, there are local laundry services that will pick up and deliver back laundry, dry cleaning, and so forth. Housekeeping services, daycare, aftercare, tutoring, those kinds of things that go beyond what the public schools are offering. You know, all those kinds of things in the big picture are not that expensive, but would be a huge relief to both partners at home in helping with that day. In fact, I read that Cisco Systems, they had a facility on their campus anyway for daycare and schools and things like that. So they just opened up that facility early on in the pandemic and they had social distanced education center there for their employees' kids from daycare age up to 12 years old. So they had tutoring, they had aftercare, and they had daycare available for their parents. And they also did it in a very safe way, according to the pandemic guidelines as well. So those are temporary workplace perks that can be put in place to help. I recall another one that was very simple that our former employer did is that what struck me as very interesting is they allowed the employees to take their chair home. Yes. Yeah. Interesting because you can't just assume that everybody has a great place, physical place to work and those chairs aren't being used in the office. So why not put them to use at home? Yeah. So even simple things like that can really have an impact because, you know, if you're sitting on the sofa for eight hours a day, it actually isn't that good for you. (laughs) Not good. And then that's just going to, you know, now you're going to have to go see the chiropractor or even worse, the physical therapist. You know, actually, I, I am seeing a physical therapist and she said she wished that there was an insurance code for Cisco related injuries due to just sitting wrong or not moving enough, you know, those kinds of things, because she's seen so much of it. So what are some of the other maybe more adventurous or dramatic things that you might suggest? Yeah. So the fourth one is around partnering with HR to really adjust processes and benefits. So that might be in addition to those flexible arrangements, how about offering full-time benefits with that part-time arrangement? So that's something that would really maybe literally save the life of that working mom who's single, can't do it all, needs reduced hours, yet for her family needs to have health care, needs to have the benefits that come with the full-time arrangement. So that's something that partnering with HR or making that happen could be an amazing save for a part of that population. Something that Netflix did is they declared a gap year, so to speak, on certain HR events. So early on, they said, you know what? We're not doing performance evaluations this year. It's just 
in the big picture, not something we're going to spend a lot of time on. You know, we're struggling just to make it through day to day, keeping up with state to state, what regulations are happening and what we can do and can't do. It's just too much. We're not going to sit down and make everybody go through that kind of theater of doing a performance review this year. We're just not going to do it. So, you know, it feels maybe wrong, but it was the right decision for them at the time. So, you know, really looking at what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Is it really important right now to spend time on that? Are we going to be able to do it well under these conditions? So maybe declaring a gap year on some of your regular routines is a solution. Sure. Well, I can recall with the company in 2008, in the fall of 2007, the entire company made a whole lot of very extensive and comprehensive goals and plans for 2008. And then about January of 2008, the whole world changed and, you know, it was pretty much had to wipe the slate clean and start over. And, and that happened this year, too. So some of that is, OK, if your process is such that you've completely disrupted it, maybe, like you say, you have to just have a gap year on something. Yes. It's better just to kind of cut your losses in some areas and move on with what's most important. Well, and I think too many companies found when they had to make all these transitions this year, they let go of a lot of stuff that there just wasn't time for that may have been kind of hanging around. It's kind of like what I used to call the zombie meetings, you know, they're just seem to be there forever. <laughs> yeah. Why are we doing this? I don't know. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Another thing that can be done that might be a little audacious, but important at the same time. So some of the government relief acts, the CARES Act, and possibly the one that was just passed. And then if you're outside of the U.S., some of your audience might also have similar benefits coming to them allowed for some paid leave if you were impacted by COVID. Of course, these had to be approved by company management. So some companies had this handled by a central team or a centralized person. So that then avoided the problem of having you know individual managers making the decision when their employee would come to them and ask. And so then you have disparity between how those decisions were made. So you might want to centralize some decisions about paid leave, even about FML and things like that to make sure that you have a fair and equitable process there. And then that also allows workers to take advantage of those things. And then, you know, you're not getting into hot water with denying employees those benefits that they have a right to use. Well, I think we had a major reset too in our informal understanding that you should always go to work when you're sick. All of a oh, sudden. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, <laughs> you were no longer considered a hero if you took your uh, illness to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And even, you know, before the pandemic, you know, somebody coughing on the other side of the partition, you know, you're kind of like, Ugh. <laughs> and definitely now that has a whole new meaning, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's amazing how our perceptions can change fairly quickly. <laughs> Yeah, so those solution sets of resetting expectations, offering those flexible arrangements, some temporary workplace perks, and then partnering with HR to adjust processes and benefits. You know, just one more with those processes, really auditing your processes for bias heavy decision points is another thing to look at. You know, when that decision on who to lay off, who to call back, you know, if you don't have to, do it based on seniority, maybe don't. <laughs> maybe make sure that it's done based on performance. You know, who are our strong performers? You know, are we a company that has diversity goals? And how can we call back employees based on their performance, based on our diversity goals and gather a spreadsheet? What are the demographics of the employees that we want to call back? And can we do it in a way that brings back employees and we can bring back some women in the workforce that maybe wouldn't have made it back in if we only did it based on seniority. I understand sometimes there's unions in place where that's a rule. Sometimes we need to work with employment laws and that might be a piece that we need to pay attention to. However, it's important to kind of look at everything and not just making a decision based on, oh yeah, I want all my friends back, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I mean, we really need to focus on the talent. And again, it might be a woman or a minority that has some new talent that we really need and we need it back in the workplace or we need to build talent. We need to attract new talent. So we need to have people in the workplace that will help us attract new talent. So I think there's a lot more considerations as you look at things 
you know, in the terms of a talent as well as diversity and inclusion type things. So exactly. Well, Linda, I thank you very much for this opportunity to share. I appreciate the knowledge that you've shared with our audience and appreciate just the opportunity to talk with you. So any final thoughts that you might have about your topics or what you're working on next? Yeah. So I just thank everybody for listening and paying attention to this issue. It's just one of many that we're facing right now. We don't want to see a workforce that's kind of bleached of women. And we want to make sure that not only do we continue the strides that women have made, but that we continue to get back to where we were and even further, right? Yeah. So what else I'm working on, just focusing on training right now in my graduate school program. And so training is an area of focus for me right now. But Lynn, I hope to be back to talk to you you and your audience about other topics in the future. Great. And we'll have your contact information as well as references to the uh, studies and stuff that you shared so that other professionals or business leaders could learn more about what you shared with us today. Absolutely. Yes. I'll provide links to some of the articles that I've referenced that includes information about the research. Great. Well, again, thank you and appreciate again having you with us today. Thank you. Again, my deepest thanks to Linda for sharing her insights and knowledge on the impact of the pandemic on working women. As a quick recap, we talked about the issue, the impact that's been felt, and four possible solutions that could help alleviate some of the problems that the pandemic has caused for working women. And Linda has also included several wonderful resources that she talked about in the episode for your further study. And please look for them at the bottom of the podcast episode. So what's up next? We're going to continue a mix of solo episodes and interviews with experts, some in manufacturing, but also in some other areas that can help you build your business and find your talent. Also, during several episodes during the month, I'm going to be sharing my thoughts and ideas on becoming a silver entrepreneur and how silver talent might help you in your business. Again, I encourage you to visit our website, download the summary at the bottom of the podcast episode as you start your exploration of these ideas. And to help you get started on your journey and to stay up to date on new episodes, please download the free worksheet, Three Steps You Need for a More Productive Workday. Thanks again for listening.